So is there a way you can make your, your, your slide in terms of presentation form? Yeah. All right. Hello. Hi all, welcome back to our SIAM chapter story talk. Uh, today we are we have honored to host our colleague Kashinga Marcelo Wimba, who is gonna present his comp exam as prop next week, where he want to, to share his work what he have been doing over the during his comp exam. And uh, his presentation is on uh, integrating the EO4 EOF into machine learning algorithm to enable climate land models. So welcome. Uh, to you all, Kashinga, you had the floor. Take us through your work. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Yao. So today I'm going to go to present what I've been working on so far for my synthesis paper, which I'll be presenting next week. And I'm inviting you to be present and see and witness it. So the topic of this presentation is integrating your F into machine learning algorithm. To emulate the climate land model. And this EOF is basically empirical orthogonal function analysis. It's a tool in climate science which is used to decompose the data set. And my advisor is Dr. Flores. So this is basically the content of the presentation. First of all, we have the soil, the soil moisture and the soil patterns, the climate model, and then I'll end with the future research and the gaps and these are the five seed papers which we considered the first of the first paper talks about a machine learning approach to emulate the biophysical parameter estimation with the climate land model and the second one talks about incorporating the empirical orthogonal function analysis which is the uof into the machine learning model model to predict the stream flow and this other one sorry is used is the third paper is the model calibration of this using the ESM version 1.0. This is a emulator, a scalable earth system emulator. Then ANAC, which is the fourth paper, which was written by Anaki, and it talks about the empirical orthogonal function analysis, like the backbone of these four methods. And the fifth paper is just the evaluating of the soil moisture, soil effects on regional soils moisture partial variability using the empirical orthogonal function analysis. Then to talk of soil, first of all, let me, I'll just define some terms. Soil is just a loose dead material, which is some quite dirty, which is found on the surface of the earth, but it's the loose material that covers most land formed, and it can be formed from parent material, which are rocks. And this process occurs by chemical mechanical weathering. By mechanical weathering means just the breaking down of the soil breaking down of the rock into fine particles while chemical weathering just referring to the when the rock reacts with something or maybe a rock reacts with water and that water tends to dissolve that rock then that rock tends to become the parent material of that soil then this soil tends to influence a lot of physical processes in our climate systems and some of them tends to partition the water energy and the carbon exchanges between the atmosphere and the land and to talk of soil, soil moisture, soil moisture is simply just the water content which is present in the soil. And the root zone, this is just a depth from zero to 200, 200 centimeter, which is regarded as the life of the plant where the plant, the plant root zone is found. And you can see from the right hand side of the figure, you can see that that region, there's a, from, let, let me point out at figure B, you can see that there's a taproot, and then that taproot is surrounded with soil, water, and oxygen. So that, that plant has all the chemical compositions it require for it to grow. Then talk of the soil pattern. Soil patterns tend to vary across the globe. For example, if you look at the Sahara Desert and the Arctic, those two regions won't have the same soil structure or soil, soil properties. And this occurs due to the bedrock type. This bedrock type is just a rock, which is regarded as the parent material of the soil, because they tend to have the physical, different physical properties. And another one is the precipitation, amount of precipitation, because precipitation tends to vary. And those regions which have to tend to have the similar climate, they tend to have the same soil properties. For example, if you look at the equatorial 
region there tend to have similarities in the soil properties. And another one is the vegetation, the biota. Some regions which tend to do, do not have this, for example, those living organisms which are in the soil, for example, in the Sahara Desert and the rainforest, those two regions will tend to have different soil properties. And another one which tend to influence this soil variation is the temperature. For example, if you look also the Sahara Desert and the Arctic, those two regions won't have the same soil properties. And also time, as time is evolving, the soils are being formed. Then what is the importance of this soil moisture? Soil moisture can be important in evapotranspiration. For example, in hydrology, it can be used to separate sensible heat and lighted heat. Then you can be able to measure the temperature of the soil. Then in hydrology, in hydrology, so soil moisture is important in infiltration, infiltration rate. It can slow down the infiltration of the water for you to have this, because if the soil is saturated, there will be less infiltration of the soil, of the water into the soil. So you tend to have more water, which can be used for other substances, other things. Then in agriculture, soil moisture can, can be useful for pre-planting pre moisture because a farmer would be able to know that, okay, since the soil is moist, I can plant the seeds now. Then Soil moisture can also be used as a drought indicator because if the soil is dry, you'll be able to tell that, okay, there's something which is happening to our soil. Maybe drought has acquired what? Yeah. And it's also a flood forecasting. Then we really need to understand this soil moisture. So one of the ways you can understand this soil moisture is modeling it. Modeling is just simply the simplification of the real world system into maybe a numerical thing into numbers so that you have a better representation of it. Then soil moisture can be used also to, can be used also using this ideological model, which are numerical or physical model. For example, the physical model is the land model, which I mentioned in the introduction. Then also the machine learning model, which we're getting as emulators in our case. Then since this model, the CLM, which is the climate land model, they tend to be computationally expensive to execute. So another alternative is to use the emulator to understand this soil moisture. Then one of the basic framework, which is shown on the schematic, the, the, the figure on the right-hand side shows the, the schematic flow of how this emulator can be used. We tend to have the data set from the model and the observation, and that data from the, the observation data will be used as a calibrator. Then that data set from the model is the one which, to, which you are trying to imitate, simply just like you are imitating the data set to have just to forecast from that data set without really executing the, the, the actual model, maybe like the climate land model. So this climate model emulator is tend to, they are less complexity and they tend to imitate the physical models without really discarding the physical model. Then why simple climate model? Because they are cheap. They can be used to forecast over millions of years. And this has been used by IPCC, which is the Intergovernment Panel for Climate Change. Then project single variable, they can be used also to project maybe temperature, sensible heat, and soil moisture. And they are fast as compared to the physical model. And they can be tunable without really considering the physical processes of the Earth, for example, wind speed, temperature, land, or such, or such. Then emulators, this consider a very small number of equations as compared to these numerical models. So where are these things are being applied, these emulators, in predicting ideological drivers to predict new scenarios with realistic weather patterns and biophysical parameter estimations, of which I'm going to show you where they've applied this to reduce the errors in the physical model. Then the presentation of the climate and geoengineering of the physical F system. Then the calibration of the, the calibration of the physical model. And also these emulators can be incorporated with this empirical orthogonal function so that you have tend to have a better result. Then what is this empirical orthogonal function analysis we are talking about? This is just the eigenvector of the covariance matrix. And it tends to look for a certain structure, a certain pattern in a data set. It's like it to give you 
modes, eigenvalues, which are corresponding to each eigenvectors in your data set. And those are tend to be arranged according to what they explain, the variance explained in your data sets, like the PC, the principal component analysis in statistics, but in climate science, it's called empirical orthogonal function analysis. And then this EOF has also been used, can also be is one of the tools which can be used to study the soil profiles, how they tend to vary across the depth as you go down. Then this is basically what the EOF analysis do. The EOF analysis, if you have the graded data set, then that graded data set is depending on space and time. Then it will decompose the two. It will have the time component and the spatial distribution. So that spatial distribution, if you look at the spatial distribution, the map of your, of your data, and you look at your time series, which is the PC, it will be able, you can tell from the PC that at this point of the year, there was this strong signal, which I'm seeing on my spatial distribution map. Then this is what basically the UAF does, is just a coherent of orthogonal spatial pattern, which are arranged in an orderly manner. Then first of all, the first leading UAF tends to explain more, it tends to explain more variability in your data set. And the way it's being computed is, this variance explains just the first of all, the top one is just the eigenvalue, then the summation of those eigenvalues, and then you compute the percentage of that. Then this PC, which is the principal component, is just the time behavior in your data set. For example, you can see from this right-hand side figure, we have this graded data set, which is the sea surface temperature, and we apply the empirical orthogonal function analysis. You tend to have two, two types. which you have the PC, which is the principal component, and you have the spatial distribution map. So if you look at your spatial distribution map and you go to your time series, you can tell where that signal is coming from, which year was that signal. It's like you're having the extreme in your data set of which is easy now to interpret. So they tend to be arranged in an orderly manner according to their percentages. Then what does this EOF, this is one of the examples from where they applied the EOF on the surface sea temperature. So here they decompose the data set. This is the first leading EOF. You can see the signal, the strong signal, which is in red here. Then you can come to your time series. Where is this signal coming from? In which year was it? So it can compare now, you can infer now from this. So it's coming maybe around here, 1990, then 2000, and also somewhere around between 2010 and 2015. So you can go back now in time. What really happened to these points now? You can interpret now what's happening to your data set. It's like it, it is the way of interpreting your data. Then this is one of the paper where they've implied, where they've used the EOF to interpret, to predict the stream flow, which is the water, the flow of water. So what they considered first was the wind speed, the temperature, the radiation, and the precipitation. And those four variables, they decompose these variables into time series. You can see these vectors here, the PC1, the PC2. So after that, they selected four of these up to PC4. And then after that, they scaled their data. And then they concatenated to have one vector. And then after that, the system conducted the experiment for seven days. And so it was a seven days time series of the stream flows. And then this is the machine learning where they're putting in their tools. Then after that, they got this vector they fed it into the machine learning. Then this is the Y input, which they're trying to predict by the didn't scale this, this part here. So now, according to what they observed from these results was, so comparing all those four watersheds, because according to their study, they considered four watersheds, which is, this is the watershed A, watershed B, and watershed C, and watershed D. So this result, the arithmetic method, which is in stripes, and the solid part, which is, the EOF, which they, where the data set was decomposed, they applied the EOF on it. Then this is the Nash Crift efficiency. It starts from if it's the symmetric, which is used to measure the accuracy, how accurate your model is predicting, how, is it, how, you, how your model is predicting with your, how it's, it's being inferred. Yeah. So you can tell now from what they observed was the data set where they applied the EOF, there was a higher accuracy as compared to the arithmetic mean where they need to apply the EOF. Then these are the four models they consider, the rotational memory, and then the gradient booster regressor, then the mouth layer perceptron, and the support vector regressor. And then across all four watersheds, 
where they applied the data set where they applied the EOF, they tended to have the higher accuracy as compared to the read to the data set where they didn't just they just got the raw data and fed it into the machine learning algorithm without really applying the technique of the EOF. Then according to what they observe, EOF tends to improve the, the prediction accuracy of the model. Then EOF integrated into model outperforms arithmetic methods. Then again, now here on this here is one of the paper where they use now the EOF, but they used it in three, in two ways. And one of the way was they optimize the parameters, like they generate the parameter, the parameter input space for the land model. Then they fed it into the machine learning mode algorithm. Then that machine algorithm, learning algorithm, it predicted the best optimal parameters. Then after doing that, they got those parameters. They fed it now, they, they gave it now to, to the climate land model of which now they did now the test case. So what they were doing to predict was the sensible eat. So this flux net observation, this is the observation in red, which is the flux net, which is the sensible eat. Then the CLM, which is the climate land model, the default tests, like they just do the default without doing the, the without applying the EOF on, your, on the parameters. Then the optimized neural network, they used the EOF on it, on the input, then they gave it to the, to the neural networks. Then the blue, the blue, the, the green color here, is the CLM with optimal parameters, those parameters which opt are optimized by the neural network. Then we can see from here, which is the PC, the principal components, how they're explaining the, the variability in the data set. So you can see that this, the data set where they didn't apply the, the CLM, where they didn't, the CLM test where they didn't apply the EOF, the prediction went out of phase because this is the observation and this is the, the optimal, the CLM with optimized neural network, neural with, with optimized parameters. Then the other one is the neural network. So you can see that the one with the with the the one with the prediction with the one with the prediction without the applying the EOF, it didn't perform better according to as compared to these other ones. Then according to their observation, because as you tend to go higher in your EOF, which is the empirical orthogonal function order, that coherent order, it tend to have noise. So according to their observation was higher EOF modes are prone to noise. Then EOF also, according to what they infer also is EOF tends to improve the prediction of the model. Then the CLM with the optimal parameters outperformed the default CLM without the optimal parameters. Then to talk of the machine learning and EOF challenges in climate science, so one of the challenges is lack of the baseline data set spanning all feasible outcomes. Like there's no actual data set which really encompasses all the physical outcome which can really occur for you to predict. Then the choice of, this is the part of exp explainability of AI. You really need to understand what you are doing before you select the algorithm to use. Then addition of the biases into the data set, this can really occur during maybe data correction and other processes, the parameterization, yeah. Then also the higher volume of data because in climate science, they tend to have a vast volume of data. Then also it is in high dimension. So for you to process it, to use it with machine learning, you really need to transform that data set into useful means which can be used by machine learning. Then predicting catastrophic events, for example, fire. Fire can be started by anyone at any time. So it's really difficult for someone to predict this fire and floods. Then also the technique to reduce the dimensionality of the EOF, because if you decompose that data set, it will have various modes from maybe EOF1, EOF2, EOF, maybe up to 100. So if there's a technique which can infuse those which are not needed, for example, if you are truncating maybe up to four, then there's a method which can get those other thing which we, because those are also are also let me say extreme which are really not really maybe not really needed they are not causing much effect to your data if can be infused your data maybe you can just have four of them or five of them which are having more information it can be useful then the gaps and gaps based on the literature which reviewed so using machine learning algorithm incorporated with the empirical orthogonal function analysis to predict the soil moisture, this area hasn't been hasn't been explored. 
Then using the EOF on the CLM soil moisture profile to really see how the profiles are changing of the soil. And also this area hasn't been explored. And then also using hydrological driver, maybe sensible heat, surface runoff, evapotranspiration, precipitation to predict soil moisture. This also hasn't been done yet. And also to use, to use deep planning to predict CLM output, which is soil moisture. This also hasn't been done yet. Then the future research idea is to design a multi model ensemble technique framework for machine learning to reduce uncertainties and errors in the data. Then applying the EOF on the CLM soil moisture simulations to decompose that data set to see how the soil profiles are varying as you go down. Then also evaluate different machine learning to predict soil moisture. Like you tend to compare how different machine learning algorithm can perform to predict the soil moisture or to emulate the soil moisture. Then also design a framework to emulate CLM using machine learning. It's like now here now to design an emulator which will be able to predict the CLM output. Then also forecast soil moisture using machine learning. And these are my references. Thank you. So let's see if everything. And on my, sorry. Regarding my computing artifact. Yeah, regarding my competing artifact, so there's a, a code on GitHub which talks about your F, integrating your F into machine learning algorithm. And also one of the, there's also a simple emulator which we tended to create to emulate the, the soil moisture from the CLM, which is the climate land model. So if you come here, you'll be able to be guided what's inside the computing artifact. So when you come here, there's an EOF function, and there's also the notebook where I'm analyzing the soil moisture now. And here, this is just the machine learning where now we're trying to emulate this soil moisture from the CLM, which is the climate land model. And here we're just calculating the weights of the soil according to the profiles we chose. Then here, this is just the data spinning of the X-array data set. And this is just now the packages which are required to run these notebooks. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much. It was a very nice presentation and uh, I've done a very good job. Hello, if you have any question, feel free to ask. Hello? Yeah, I can yeah, hear go, you. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so, yeah, I have a question concerning the artifact. Okay. Yeah, basically you didn't show any result of your machine learning or whatever. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, there is, let me. Yeah, so if you come in this, let me go just to the notebook. Yeah, so the data set I'm using is like the data set, the way it was created, they had this conference. What we are trying to infer from the data set, where are these errors, where are the errors coming from in the model? So what they did, they got different different modelers. One of them was CLM, 
and the other one was orchid and the other one was is it jb jb should be jb jb something yeah it's like sp mip where they an umbrella so that they now try to analyze the data where are the errors coming from so they did various experiments to do that so it's like the first part of the experiment the soil hydraulic parameters was provided by the the this soil parameter intercomparison project which is the umbrella of that conference then the second experiment is the soil hydraulic parameter which is was derived derived from the common soil properties texture textural soil properties and the third experiment was the reference line where the model was just running the default data scores without really doing anything on the parameters then the experiment four where they converted now it's like they made everything long and the second the third experiment 4b they made everything clear in the model and the experiment 4c they made everything sealed to see really how the variations are in the data set so here i'm just importing that data then here i'm computing the weights according to the soil profiles we selected which is a layer from zero to a root zone from one point from zero to 1.7 centimeters or oh, meters sorry then here i'm just explaining what the empirical orthogonal function analysis is whereby just we have the graded data set which is depending on space and time and in that data set you dis, you decompose it into a, a time component and also a spatial distribution then this is the code which is computing the EOF, the empirical orthogonal function analysis. Then when you come here, I'm just now selecting now that from zero to 10, which are just the layers. I'm slicing the layers from the, from the data. Then here now I'm just checking now the variance explained. You can see the first EOF, which is this one. This is just the index from zero. So this is the first EOF. And the first EOF tend to explain the variabilities around maybe 18% or 19% approximately. So this is experiment one, experiment two, experiment three. And you can really see that there's no much variation when you look at them. Then here, I'm now just plotting this data set. So you can see now what's really happening. If you look at these signals here, this is the, the, is it the, the red part here, the red part here. Now you can come to a time series and check this because this is soil moisture. You can see now what's really going on in your data set for you to interpret. You can come to your time series now here. Yeah. So now, so after doing this, after getting this, this UF, because these are just various modes, you can have UF1, UF2, UF3. So you can now select now which have the most variance. For example, here, you can truncate maybe from zero to five. Then you get this data set, you reconstruct, you come up with a new data set because you tend to have more accuracy as compared to the others. Then here, this is just the bar stacks, which is just similar to this time series. So now this is the second UF, but the, the surprising part here, we're trying to check how the soil profiles are varying. So we selected the first, the first two layers and also went for the first 10 layers. It's like the first 10 layers here, the first 10 layers, you can see how the variability are. This is out of phase, it's not really, so you can tell now this data set, there's something going on with the data because it was conducted using various various methods, various parameters. So this year F2 can be able to decipher this data set. You can really see what's going on in the data. And then, so this is the second year F and this is the third part and let me show you just the last part where they after doing the reconstruction so now here we wanted now to see if it's true if you get the data set is it really going to explain the same thing if you look, really look at it so here this is the first the reference data which we didn't decompose then the second row here is the reconstructed data after extracting the just four four modes from the data set and then we plotted them then you can see the similarity that this is true they are agreeing so the uf can be used to the to study these variabilities in the data set and let me go to the other script <coughs> sorry so this other script
So this other script now talks about just the modeling of the spatial, the temporal coefficients, which is just the time series, the pieces. So this is the EOF, which is decomposing the data. And then here we are selecting the first 10 layer, layers, and then compute the mean and compute the average weighted sum. And then after that, this is just the same thing, the EOF, which is comp computing, it decomposes the data set. Then here we have the target variable, which is we are trying to predict the soil moisture. And then that soil moisture we did the two at two process at two at two points. We did at two points, whereby the first one we didn't construct the data set, which is the y input. The second one we construct we constructed the data. We constructed the data. And then we plotted the two. So you can see that they are similar. And then here. I'm just now visualizing this time series data, the EOF, which is, this is the first one. And the three variables we considered the first, this is the soil moisture, and this is the total surface temperature, and this is the evapotranspiration, and this is the snow, snow mount, snow, snow melt, sorry. So this variable, the reason why we consider this is because they tend to be related to each other. If you have the temp, if you have high temperature on the soil, you tend to have less soil moisture. Then if you have, I evapotranspiration, also you tend to have less soil moisture, it's like they are, they are related. So we chose these variables. Then this is the Fed. Yeah, this is the Fed. And then here now, I'm just explaining now what this simple emulator is doing. So you have the code here now, it's computing now, it's trying to predict this soil moisture. Then let me go to the results. So we fitted twice. The first one we constructed, the first one not constructed. So according to what we observed was, the one we constructed Y, it performed better than the other one which didn't construct, which we didn't construct the data set, the input Y. If you compare to the reference, which is the data set which didn't perform any, which we didn't perform anything, it's like the raw data, the original data set. So the Y we constructed, the, the, the neural network we constructed Y outperformed the one with the unconstructed Y. Yeah. So these are some of the results. But with the interest of time, maybe let's go to the questions and feedback. All right. Thank you. Now, is there any other question? For thanks for, for sharing now. Uh, your resolution or taking out to your artifacts. Is there any other question? Hi, Kachinga. Hi, Ibrahim. Yeah, can you go back to your um, GitHub one sec? Yeah, I have just two questions. The first okay. one was was the um, neural networks where you plotted the the loss function. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can see train and tests there. So were you using your testing as uh, your testing set as a validation set? Yeah, in this case, yeah. We didn't split the test there because due to the because we tended to have just 30, 30 years, 30 year annual means. So it's like you just have 30 data points. So it was somehow difficult to decompose that data set to, to split that data set. So can you come back with that explanation? Huh? Can you say that again, please? Oh, it's like what we did was we computed the annual means of the data set. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't have enough points to split it to validation and training and test. Oh, okay. So yeah. you so you have um, just 30 data points? Yeah. So how For many goes, test. so how many huh? goes into the testing? You said? I said how many percent goes into the testing? The percentage which go to which went to the testing. I yeah. think we considered up to it's like we got the years, not really the the the, the random randomly. 
we just got the a certain part of the years from yeah, yeah, 2000 yeah. yeah from 2002 because the data ranges from 1980 to 2011 so we just mm -hmm. got now from 2000 to to the end which is 2011 no so as a testing set for like yeah the testing set. okay so i was just wondering if um if that model is um the performance when you maybe probably launch it into production because it already recognizes the testing set for validation for validation yeah uh, I mean, because in this okay. case the testing set was acting as a validation am i correct yeah 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 so i was just looking at it in the standard machine learning practices yeah so how, how that fit into the pipeline because we know the testing set should not be seen by the model at all yeah so is there a reason why we have to use the testing as validation here uh there is there's no actual reason i'll point at it's just the limitation of the data set we have okay yeah I was, but it, well, i was just wondering if you could um maybe like up sample the data set instead of taking the yearly average probably you could do it monthly that will give you more data points the monthly uh yeah it could be also one of the ways to do but if you the data set is the next net cdf data set so if you are mm -hmm. competing the if you are computing the mean of the month it's like it's going to give you it's going to give you one year and it's like it's just going to sum all the years it's going to group by all the years all the, all those months in your data and then it gives you just one value for december all the december's in your data it just gives you one value oh okay okay okay, okay. yeah well um i don't know i don't want to drag it too long i just wanted to say if you could um maybe one way or the other get your data into pandas then there's a function in pandas called resampling it can do the, it can do the resampling for you okay yeah, yeah i tried that to do to convert my data frame into pandas i know it's like again somehow it's because you're dealing with you are dealing with the lat and loan, the lang latitude and longitude. So it was somehow challenging. Sorry about geopandas. There is also geopandas that can geopandas. Ah, yeah. I've never used geopandas before. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Because it takes into account the lat and loan. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. I I also wanted to ask about the packages. Can you go back to the file containing the packages? Uh I think these are just the script. I didn't want to populate the notebooks with the packages. This. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the idea here is you created a notebook for the packages. Yeah, for the packages. Tell them to go inside the notebook, like from packages install uh, import something. Yeah, you can just call it, for example, here. this one here okay i got it i got it i got it so um i was just wondering if there was going to be like a requirement file because um for someone who has not um used these functions before they don't all come pre-installed in your python so maybe you could create a requirement.txt that anyone could easily install and then they have all oh, okay i mean just suggesting Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. Do you have any other question? No, Master. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you, Michael. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted uh, you to explain to me uh, how you're computing like the basis functions. So it's not like I have a question, but I just want to understand the process, yeah. 
or the process in the notebook? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this your F is like a standard package. Someone has already written it's like NumPy. You can just call it. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you can just call it somewhere. Is it somewhere around in your GitHub? Yeah. And these are just, it's written in X array. Okay. So this is where now I'm calling it here, here F. And here now, I'm making it now suit to my data set, which I have. So this function, which I'm writing is the EOF function, which is taking in my net CDF data set because my data set is in four, there's, there's four dimension and three dimensions. So it's, it's four dimensions it to take up here. It's, it's three dimension it would do this. It's like I'm detrending here on this top part. I'm just detrending the data set. Then here, I'm just extracting, this is the number of latitude, longitude, and this is the number of longitude, latitude, and this is the number of data time points in the, my data set because it's a dairy, dairy data set which I'm having. Then here, I'm just now calling my data, extracting this lat and also extracting this longitude from my data. Then here now, I'm just taking now the square roots, like now I'm computing the weights of across the globe, across the land, over the land. Then after computing that, I'm now initializing that UA function, which is able now to compute this, to decompose this into various modes. So what is doing here, this is called the solver which is here the number of VOF, which is just basically the, the time of the number of VOF which you need. Maybe if you want 10, if you need five, you can just put five there. And then it will be able to compute those modes you want to give you those modes you want. And here it's computing the pieces. And here I'm computing the variance explained. And this is just the eigenvalues, which is giving me here the lambdas. And these are the errors of the data. So this is the, the, the errors of the eigenvalues. And this is the correlation coefficients of the spatial distribution, how the, how the maps are correlating with the time series. And here, this is just the covariance matrix. And here, this is just the total anomaly of the variance. And this is the projected field of the time series. Then here, it's just adjusted standard deviation. And here, this is now the part of reconstructing. So after you select those modes you want, that data set can be reconstructed. You just come up with the data which does have, which has less noise. And then here, I was just trying to see now, because the reconstructed data set, if you project this time series data, if you project the time series data, the pseudo time pieces into, into this, into this, this this guy here, this piece, if you project the time series on this guy here, the pieces, you are going to have the reconstructed data set after selecting this the certain modes which you want. So now I showed in the I don't the, that there was a part where I showed the reconstructed and not non-constructed. So they also performed similarly, they gave the similar results. But the whole mm -hmm. function is based on the singular valid decomposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Th thank you. All right. That's good. I, just, I have one question to ask. You are talking about your EOF in the climate, uh, uh, land climate model, so or climate model. So, what's the difference between the fiscal or the numerical model? I didn't get that well. The numerical mm -hmm. model. What is different between the numerical model and the and the UF model? No, the the UF is not a model. It's just one of the tools which can be used to to re, really get rid of the noise in the data set. And then after getting rid of the, the noise in the data set, then that data set maybe can be used. You can also infer from that data set. You can interpret the data. 
And that data set also can be used as an input into a machine learning model. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. So it means that at the end of the day, you are still using the, the climate model. Yeah, but it's not really that we are trying to replace the climate plan model, but oh. because it's computationally expensive, if someone really want to maybe to perform maybe a short time prediction, doesn't really need to go to to a, a, a supercomputer to compute it, compute what he wants. But he can okay. just use the emulator and be able to infer or predict what he wants to predict, maybe soil moisture or what. Yeah. All right. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yeah, so you were talking about uh, dimensionality reduction, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if, if you have a data set and you try to reduce the dimension. Like, I don't know. So first of all, there's a portion of the variance you want to explain because you might select uh, the new features that do not explain 100% of the variance. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering like which percent, like which proportion of the variance was explained and as to, and definitely if you are going to use the new features in your machine learning model, you already know that these new features do not explain maybe up to 100% of the original variance or so some information is already lost. Yeah. So I'm, wond I'm wondering how you cater for that loss of information. Okay. Yeah, so what this EOF2 can be used, it can be used in two ways. The first of all, you can reduce the dimensionality or you can just maybe just get one variable, not really if you, because if you tend to have maybe precipitation, soil temperature, surface runoff, you can decompose that data set into maybe a simpler mode, right? Into a simpler, mm -hmm. yeah, a simpler version. But also you can just get that one variable and decompose that variables, that variable. And that variable, those modes which are in the data sets, like they are really referring to something which is happening in the real world. And I don't know, the part of the variance explained, it's like we just consider that we just assumed that this part of the data, which has a higher percentage, is more, it is it's less prone to noise and you can get that data set and use it and maybe interpret that data set without really considering this because according to what they, they've showed in other studies they've used eof in various means some they've used to decompose it and to decompose the variables and some they've just used the eof2 maybe just to interpret one variable what's happening in reality and to see what's happening in nature like they compare the observation and the eof in time. I don't know if I've answered the question. Yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to know the percentage of variance explained. Maybe you explain up to 80%, 90% or something like that. Uh, it doesn't really mean it can be 50% if you are lucky. Yeah, but maybe the percentage you can consider maybe from maybe somewhere around 10 going above, I think that's a percentage you can try to consider in climate science, because it's it's, it's like the, mod, the data set which is coming from the model, it also is having some errors in it. So it's one of the so limitations. You, you mean like you can explain up to maybe 10%? Yeah, 10% is you can consider it. Wow, that seems like 90% of uh information is lost yeah yeah <laughs> so it's one of the limitations like we don't really have the technique to which can really get these other modes as in infuse them into the modes you want it's like it to give you up to a certain a certain value a certain maybe up to is it 100 somewhere there but if there's a way you can truncate those into maybe a specific maybe you just get 10 of them which is having all all of them inside without really discarding any. Maybe that could be also an help for two. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you are losing like 90% of the information 
And then it's even surprising that the machine learning models are performing well with the data. Yeah, so I think that's that's just my question. Okay. Yeah. There's one question in the chat, uh, Kashinga. Ibrahim asked a question in the chat. Oh, oh, yeah, no, we didn't try that one. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just um just to build on what Titus just asked now that if okay. you lose like 90% of your data set, that's uh, of the information in the data set, that's huge. So I was just uh, wondering if you can use um, stuff like TSNE, TSNE that you can really deal with the variance directly per se. Maybe TSNE, uh, we also have Yuma. I I'm just suggesting. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, but the limitation with this, you can't really see what's happening on the spatial distribution because you really need to see on the spatial mm -hmm. distribution. But because the UF, which would do, what it does, it will give you the time component and the spatial distribution map. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Kashinda, for this wonderful talk. Uh, hopefully, you uh, Presentations on Tuesday, 15th, right? Yeah, Tuesday. So it's going to be in person or online? I think, according to what we agreed, it's supposed to be in person, but we okay. haven't picked the venue yet. Yeah. Okay. Don't so I'll let you know. Share. Yeah. All right. Sure. All yeah. right. Thanks to you all for joining us today. We appreciate okay. your time. Yeah. Thank you See. so much for your feedbacks. <laughs> Yeah, thank right. you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you.